This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I've been in practice for over 25 years now. But I started podcasting two years ago, approximately, because I wanted to extend the walls of my practice. I wanted to reach those that may already be very familiar with therapy, but would appreciate a different perspective from another mental health professional. But I also wanted to reach out to people who may only just have been diagnosed with anxiety or depression or an eating disorder, or they may be having problems in their relationships because of things they can't seem to work through. If either one of those is you, then I hope you'll stick around and listen to this episode of Self Work. And even if you're somebody who'd never darken the door of a therapist or never can see yourself doing that, maybe you'll just be curious enough to listen in. Today, we're going to be talking about a question I've asked myself many times, and certainly that I've heard many of my patients ask. Why couldn't I have figured this out sooner? I'm sure you've said it. We've all said it. That old hindsight is twenty twenty thing. But when you have tragedy or loss or missed opportunities because either something happened or something didn't happen, then that question can loom very large and be a factor in your grief or your sadness. So how do we try to live with the ambiguity of not knowing? How do you live with the fear that you're missing something or that something horrible may happen at any minute? These aren't easy answers, certainly, but I'll offer you some of my ideas. And I'll touch also on how this particular conversation, that particular question, could apply to someone who's living in the rules of perfectly hidden depression and give an example of a woman finally telling a secret that she had feared for so long revealing. What she found out was what she had feared did not happen, and she had to grieve. Today, our listener email, which we feature every episode, is from someone whose husband is dealing with hidden emotions and wants her, his wife, to be his therapist. Not a great idea, but I'll talk more about that. For those of you who might not know what I mean when I say perfectly hidden depression, because you're new to self-work, it's a book I'm writing for New Harbinger that'll be published in 2019, but I've been writing about perfectly hidden depression for over four years now on my own website, drmargaretrutherford.com, and it's about a mixture of perfectionism and over-responsibility, detachment from painful emotions, being someone who is insistent on only counting your blessings and has distinct trouble with being vulnerable. I call that group of behaviors, or a syndrome, perfectly hidden depression. And it's gotten my attention big time because the suicide rates are going up both worldwide, but they've gone up substantially in the United States in the last two decades. And I think one of those reasons is because of the pressure of perfectionism. You can check out Perfectly Hidden Depression. My very first episode on it was episode three and four. I wanted to get it in early because I was told that the average number of episodes per podcaster was eight. So (laughs) I really wanted to talk about it. And then there are other episodes on Perfectly Hidden Depression interspersed throughout self-work. But today we're going to be talking about why couldn't I have figured this out sooner? So many of us have asked ourselves this very question. Why couldn't I have figured this out sooner? I'm sure you've said it. I've said it. And you know what? You're in good company. Hindsight is so much more clear, obviously. And no matter what the thing is that you wanted to figure out, then when you look back, often you need to grieve. Maybe it was a sign that your marriage was falling apart. Maybe you missed the early signals of cancer. 
Maybe denial played a huge role. You didn't want to see it, so you didn't see it. Or maybe no one could have seen what was going to happen. Often tragedy is like that. Something happens that no one could have foreseen. In fact, I looked up the word tragedy. What is defined as is a lamentable, dreadful, or fatal event or affair, a calamity, a disaster. Most of us certainly who might be able to predict a tragedy or a disaster would have tried to prevent it. And sometimes we cannot. In order to live in some kind of sanity, you and I have to believe with some amount of confidence that we can predict or know what may happen in the next minute. No one knows they're going to miss a stare and fall and break their leg. No one can predict that a car is going to appear out of nowhere and slam into yours. No one can see that a simple headache could be the onset of a life-threatening disease. We can be alert We can be as prepared as possible. We can educate ourselves, but we can't know everything. But it's tremendously hard to do when tragedy has actually occurred to you or someone you love. It can take years to not feel as if something else that will break your heart is right around the corner. And rebuilding some semblance of safety can occur, but it takes time. I remember working with a young girl now several years ago who was brutally attacked. I won't give you the details because I promise you, you'd find them hard to get out of your mind. I'll just say that she was physically very damaged. She had a lot of scarring. And when she came in to begin work with me, I remember thinking, wow, those scars are going to be such a permanent symbol to her of the lack of safety in her life, at least that occurred that particular afternoon. As we worked together, she would slowly get better and feel that her anxiety was beginning to abate, but then she'd have to have another operation or another procedure. She said to me one time, I don't know how I'm ever going to feel safe again. It just so happens, several months ago, I actually saw her in the community And she told me that she had found a way to feel safe and that it had to do actually with forgiveness. But let's talk about the nature of grief a bit. Grief can be about what did happen. Obviously, for example, with that particular patient, it was definitely tied to the horrible events in her life. Or it can also be for what didn't happen An opportunity for healing or joy was missed. Maybe there never was resolution to a conflict between you and a parent, and then they died. And there's the tragedy in it because all hope for reconciliation is now gone. Or maybe you got scared in a relationship and never told someone that you were falling in love with them. And now you hear they're marrying someone else. This isn't a calamity like a tornado or an attack, but it's tragic in its own way. Forgiveness is essential, self-forgiveness especially. That's when your own self-compassion plays a role. Whatever happened, there were good reasons why you were the way you were and now are the way you are. Personally, or as a therapist, I've never been able to figure out how to go back and find the one domino that if you picked it up, None of the other dominoes would fall, and everything else in your life would be happy. I see people searching for that one domino quite a bit. You only know the outcome of the way things are. You may think that you know what would have happened if you tried to resolve the conflict with that parent or told your friend that you were falling in love with them. Maybe things would have been different, but you don't really know. So we have to look back on our lives sometimes and grieve. You can get stuck in one stage of grief, in anger, in sadness, but you don't want that. That keeps you living in the past. So you have to find a way to accept what you may now wish you'd seen earlier. That grief that's tied to what didn't happen has to be worked through as well. You know, it takes living life one day at a time 
to gain the experience and wisdom and courage that you need. If your goal is self-acceptance, which I hope it is, you need to accept your need to grieve and then live life looking for those opportunities to grow and change. You need to let your grief make you less frightened, not more. So maybe there's a good chance you won't miss other opportunities that come your way. As many of you know, my passionate interest for the last few years has been directed toward people who are keeping their depression secret. They're keeping emotional pain a secret out of fear, out of habit, or out of the belief that they'll be rejected or seen as incompetent. So their life looks perfect. But let's say you're someone with perfectly hidden depression and you decide to risk changing. You begin to share with others who you really are, what happened in your life that was hard. You tell them why you've been covering up for so long. This kind of move can be tremendously liberating, and I would celebrate with any of you that decided to do that. But that's when you might also run into this question. Anybody who makes significant changes in their life has to do this, because that question again is, why couldn't I have figured this out sooner? And when you ask yourself that question, you may very well find grief. Grief that you were hidden for so long. Grief about opportunities not taken because of your perfectly hidden depression. Grief about the circumstances of the trauma that led to the creation of your hiding. Again, this is a normal part of any healing process. As you recognize and gain new information about what it's like to live your life differently, you may have to mourn some of the life that you've lived. I want to tell a story about a woman named Spencer. Spencer met with substantial grief as she began to risk sharing a secret that she feared telling for many years. She came to therapy to find ways to bolster herself for what she feared would happen if she told the secret that she'd been keeping, and that secret was that she was gay. Although she'd been mostly living with her partner for well over three years, she had her own home, and when family would visit, she'd welcome them there with open arms. A cheerful, smart, hardworking woman in her late 20s, Spencer wasn't out at the law firm where she worked either. She talked about things that she and her partner did over the weekends, but she feared rejection. She was popular and funny at work, but when not headed to her partners, her nights would be spent sitting in the dark, and she was an overeater. Her parents had been loving, but had given her the message over the years that they didn't think she was quite smart enough to be successful, and she'd been determined to prove them wrong. They were conservatively religious, and although they'd never mentioned any problems with being gay, the subject just wasn't discussed. They often told her they worried because she was alone and asked her about dating. Her answers had remained vague. Her mom shared way too much with her about her own problems, and Spencer dutifully listened and gave advice for hours. So much of her own life was sequestered. She didn't have much to talk about except work, and so focusing on her mom was easy. Her partner, whose family knew and supported the couple, was growing impatient. It was only when Spencer's very close cousin got married during the holidays that she turned the corner and decided, you know, it's now or never. I can't spend another holiday like this one. There was something about her cousin's life moving on and hers remaining stagnant that was intolerable. So the day came, she'd written a letter which she sent, and she had a visit scheduled with family the following weekend. She didn't hear anything for a couple of days, but then her parents called. She was shocked to discover that they were very supportive. It's good to know you're not alone. They talked extensively the following weekend and asked to meet her partner. When they did a few weeks later, things couldn't have been better, and Spencer and her partner began to plan to get married. That's when Spencer's grief became palpable. She had spent so much time and effort hiding. She began ruminating about time missed and opportunities lost. I've wasted a whole decade of my life trying to be what I thought others expected. Before any planning could continue, her work was to sit with this grief and all of its components. You may have a similar story to Spencer's, not necessarily about hiding being gay, but hiding other things about yourself, 
or somehow not taking opportunities, somehow limiting your life. Spencer's story was about a literal secret that kept her real life and emotions locked away. And you may have similar secrets and ones that you believed if anyone knew they'd reject you. But what's important about her story is that grief can await you when you realize that change is possible and you make those changes. It's essential to work through that grief. You need to write about it, talk about it, and feel it. It does not mean you've made the wrong decision. In fact, it simply means that you have to find the meaning in the years that you stayed silent. Just like after a divorce, if people say, well, that was a waste of my life, I always get very sad because those years had meaning, and that's what you need to find. You have to have compassion for yourself and discover joy as you try to not allow other opportunities to slip by you. Our listener email today is short and sweet, and it's from a woman. My husband of 20 plus years suffers from hidden emotions. He was abused by his mother when she got divorced. His being emotionless has damaged our marriage. We have seen therapists together and alone, but now he's asking me to help him start learning how to have emotions. I don't have a clue on how to help him. Can you help me with book references or something? Thank you. I've talked before about a condition called alexithymia, which is actually a condition where a person cannot connect with emotions. But my guess is this man's problem is much more tied with the abuse that he suffered and the trauma that he suffered. So I say, hi, that's a tall order from your husband for sure. And I'd be quick to say that you can't really serve as a therapist to him. It's not good for either one of you. Certainly, I can't be a therapist to my friends or to my family. I can listen and try to give advice, but I'm not objective. I love the person I'm talking to, and I can try to be as objective as possible, but still, that's not the perspective or the stance that you really need. So I would definitely not recommend that you try to be your husband's therapist. I do know of a great book that he might like. It was written a while back, but it's quite good. I Don't Want to Talk About It is the book written by Terrence Real. It's written for men who are depressed and, as the title suggests, are having a difficult time expressing their emotions. I really love this book because it gives a lot of case material, meaning that Dr. Real pulls cases from his practice and actually weaves a beautiful story, sometimes a very poignant, painful one, but he makes his point through the lives and the changes of his patients. It's not some dry, conceptual, theoretical book. So again, the name of it is, I don't want to talk about it. Also, Brene Brown's work on the gifts of imperfection and vulnerability can be very helpful. And of course, my own book on perfectly hidden depression will be coming out in 2019. I had to get a plug in, right? So I hope that's helpful to you. And thanks so much for being a listener. Again, we can get kind of caught up in what the secret is, whether the secret is abuse or something you don't want to talk about, whether it's being gay or where it's having other problems in your life. But I promise you that secrecy, that hiding, whether you fit the rest of the criteria for perfectly hidden depression or not, can be very, very damaging to yourself. So I hope that these stories will help you look at that. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Self Work and a discussion of the question, why couldn't I figure this out before? You can reach me in lots of different ways. People are emailing me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. Those are confidential emails. I'm the only one to see them. And I will answer you. I'm getting more and more of them, which absolutely delights me. So it may take me a little longer to get back with you than it has in the past. But please continue sending those in. It helps me to know who's listening, what you'd like to hear about, I got a recent request from someone saying, could you talk about parenting adult children? And I plan to do that. It was a great suggestion. My website is drmargaretrutherford.com. If you subscribe there, you'll get 
a newsletter which will give you my weekly blog posts and my weekly podcast. So it's a great way to make sure you don't miss self-work. Or certainly subscribe wherever you listen. That would be great too. And please, so many of you have left ratings and reviews. And that is the major way other people who might stumble upon self-work, which happens a lot, can see that maybe it would be valuable for them to listen to. So even though I have over 200 ratings and reviews, or actually I love some more written reviews, please leave yours. As they say with politics, your vote counts. (laughs) I also have started a new Facebook group. You can check it out at facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. We talk about lots of topics there. I come in and out. I believe we all have our own bit of wisdom. And so I really encourage people to share theirs with each other. So check it out. Facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. Thanks for being here today. It means so much to me. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret. And you've been listening to Self-Work.